Hey, this is Joshua from the church at Mon River. Thanks for taking time to listen to this teaching. We have one purpose here, and that is to make followers of Jesus. And we hope that this recording helps accomplish this purpose in your life. Well, it's good to be here. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been a long weekend, but also a short weekend in the same sense. Uh, we've had a great time um, here in Pittsburgh, just uh, visiting with Joshua and Angela, and um, brought some students down from our church, um, from our youth group. So we've had, we've had a great time. But um, not to end on a bad note, um, I don't want you guys to think, uh, just stick with me through this, okay? Because um, we're going to be talking about suffering, um, so it's kind of a difficult way to start a Sunday morning, especially when it's raining outside and kind of dreary. Um, but there's, there's a lot of hope in it, and um, it's going to be really good. So like Joshua said, we're in, in the book of 2 Corinthians, um, right, and we're kicking it off. So just to give you some background and some insight as to what the book of 2 Corinthians is, um, it's a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth, and he had written at least two of those. Um, so there's the book of 1 Corinthians, and now we're in 2 Corinthians. Um, and his heart was to be able to visit the church in Corinth, um, but he was unable to do so. So he writes them a letter, and as it is in Paul's fashion, typically, um, he writes them a letter, and it has two purposes. Um, first purpose is to encourage them, and then the second, the second purpose is to kind of call out things that were misaligned in the church. Um, and Joshua hinted at that, right? He talks about some really awkward, some really difficult um, topics in the book of 2 Corinthians, um, but there's always an underlying tone of encouragement in all of that. And I, I've just grown to really appreciate that. And I think that's really helpful in the Christian walk to be able to take some encouragement, but also look to how you can change and strengthen your walk and grow in Christ. And so we're going to see that today um, through the topic of suffering. Um, uh, but today we're going to be focusing on the first 11 verses, and it is within these verses that I want you to see this. I want you to see the importance of sharing suffering with the church. All right, the importance of sharing suffering with the church. And you might wonder why I think that is so important and why Paul thinks that's so important. And we're going to break it down even further into, the, into two main reasons. The first reason is suffering works as a way of encouragement to others in the church. That's actually the second one. Sorry. The first one is suffering is a part of the Christian life. And the second one is suffering can work as a way of encouragement to the church. Um, and that might sound confusing um, if, you're, if you're new to this uh, and to how a church works, or it might sound cliche if you've been in the church for a while. But like I said, hang with me. Let's break this down. Let's dive into it. I'm really, really excited. Um, it was convicting to me. It was, in, it was encouraging to me, as always. And so we're going to start uh, by looking at suffering comes with being a Christian. All right? And so 2 Corinthians is really, is really cool. Um, it starts off just like any of Paul's other letters. Um, Paul writ, wrote a ton of the New Testament. And in all, all the books, pretty much all the books that he wrote, um, he uses the phrase that here we see in verse 2, grace is to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? You can flip back through. I wrote them all down. Um, so if you want to write them down and, and you want to follow up with me on that, uh, go ahead and do it. But we see that same exact phrase in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3, Galatians 1 verse 3, Ephesians 1 verse 2, Philippians 1 verse 2, Colossians 1 verse 2, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We see it in 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, right? You can go through the whole, almost all the books that Paul wrote, and he always opens his books with that phrase, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus. And I think there's a couple reasons Paul does that. I think he wants to set the tone that he comes at them with grace and peace, um, because some of the stuff he deals with is heavy. Um, and I think he also recognizes that suffering is a reality, and that sometimes when the churches were receiving these letters, life wasn't all that grand. Um, as a matter of fact, when they received these letters, um, I believe wholeheartedly there might have been an element of uh, nervousness and, oh no, we got another letter from Paul. Like, what is it going to say? Like, what are we doing wrong? What's not going well? But to open it up and to read that, right, there's a, there's a calming sense to that, that grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's, that's really encouraging. 
Um, but if you back out a little bit more and you look at the first few verses, I think it's really interesting to note how many times the word God is used. So um, let's read it again, and I'll count off on my fingers, but you also count, right? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to God's church at Corinth with the saints who are throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comforts. So just in those three verses, we see the word God used like six different times. And I think that's even more supporting of that verse 2, where he's, where he's coming at them with grace and peace. I think he's clearly communicating and solidifying that he is following the will of God to serve the church that is God's with an attitude of grace and peace that comes from God, all the while giving praise to God for the mercies and comforts that God has given us. Right? I know it's a lot. That's a mouthful. Um, but it's true, right? Paul is pointing us back to, listen, guys, I'm writing you this letter. I'm encouraging you. And it's all coming from God. All of this is coming from God as a way of encouragement. So why does Paul start like this? Why, why is it so important to him to be this repetitive, to be um, this convincing that all praise, all glory, and all honor are due to God. And it's supposed to be encouragement coming from God. Well, I think he uses these first three verses to set the tone for verse, <laughs> verses 4 through 11, where he, he dives into some, some heavy things. So let's look at verse 4. Still talking about God, he, he writes, He comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves received from God. For as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so through Christ our comfort also overflows. And that word affliction, um, I had to pause when I, read, when I was studying this, and I don't think I really understood what the word affliction means. It's kind of a word, a word we don't use um, in today's language. Like if you were to come up to me and ask me how I was doing, I wouldn't say, oh, I'm afflicted. <laughs> you know, that's just not something that uh, we use much. But it was, it's a common word. Um, it's, it's best translated from the original language to that word affliction. But that word affliction really is kind of heavy. Um, there's a sense of I'm being afflicted, right? There's a sense of I feel like the entire world is against me and coming on top of me. And so I think we all can, can share moments in our lives where we've felt like that. We've walked through a, a season of life, um, whether it is a season of life spiritually or physically with an illness or mentally. Um, it could be anything. But we've all walked through those times where we feel like, God, is there anything left? Is there anything that's going for me? Is there anything going my way? And the crazy part is, is I think that is a really, really true reality of the Christian life. Um, and what's unique, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, so um, we might get back around to this as well, but um, I think we as Christians, um, and most of us who have grown up um, maybe in America or, or from um, a well-to-do family where there's not a lot of affliction, right, we have it right off the bat, um, pretty easy. And so that when affliction comes, when suffering comes, it kind of takes us by surprise. And we might pause for a minute. I find myself doing this all the time, that when, when things get hard, I start to wonder, like, did I make a wrong decision? Did I mess up somewhere? Is God punishing me for this? So in, in my church back in New York, we, we've been walking through the book of Acts, and we just talked, uh, we just um, walked through Acts 21 and Acts 22. And in Acts 21, you see Paul, same guy, right, earlier in his ministry, and he's traveling around like he always did, and he's ministering to all these churches and encouraging them, right? It was just a couple of his missionary journeys that we're looking at. Um, and he's, he's in Jerusalem in Acts 21, and he, he has, has his heart, he has his passion to go reach the people in Ephesus. And Everybody, or no, sorry, he's in Ephesus, and he has a heart to go reach the people in Jerusalem. So he's in Ephesus, and the people of Ephesus are like, 
yo, Paul, you cannot go to Jerusalem. You cannot, because there are people there wanting to kill you. Like, there are, there are people who are, who are literally waiting at the gates for you to step foot inside the city so they can arrest you, drag you in front of people that already hate you, and then basically kill you and stone you. And so Paul is faced with this decision, right? And he's faced with the decision of, do I stay in Ephesus and keep ministering? I have a good thing going for me. It wasn't like his ministry was dry. It wasn't like he was bored. It wasn't like there wasn't any work to be done. There was work to be done. Right? Or he could follow, follow what God's will was, what he, he knew was God's will was for him to go to Jerusalem. And he's standing at this fork in the road, right? And he has to make a decision. And he decides that the gospel is worth dying for. So he goes to Jerusalem and continues on Jerusalem. And what happens, right? He gets to Jerusalem. He gets immediately imprisoned, immediately dragged before a crowd. And they're starting to question him. They're like kicking up dust and taking off their clothes, like getting ready to stone him. And I can't imagine that in that moment, Paul was like, I'm going through some suffering. I'm feeling afflicted. Did I make a wrong decision in coming here? Right? But again, and that's why I think that we get it wrong in our minds. We think that when we hit those hard times, that we assume that, there's, that, that it's God punishing us, that we made a wrong decision. But it's not. It's not, right? God gives us those sufferings so we can learn through it and we can walk through it. And as we're going to see here, he gives us those sufferings. And part of that, what we can do with that is share that with the church and it strengthens the church. And so we're going to look at that and we're going to see that um, um, further on. But um, bringing us back to where we are right now, right, in verses 4 and 5, I think it's really unique to notice that in these verses, there's no indication that suffering is not going to happen but there's every indication that suffering is going to happen. Because in verses 4 and 5, he says he comforts us in all our affliction. Not if, not in our affliction if it so happens or if it so occurs. But he's saying, no, he comforts us in all of our affliction when it will happen. Moving on, he says, so, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction. Not like if you ever get the chance to to comfort somebody in their affliction. No, like, so that you may be able to comfort those in affliction. And then again in verse 5, through the comfort we, re- we ourselves receive from God. Not that we might receive from God, that we receive from God, right? And we could park there for a whole lot and how God is so faithful to comfort us in our moments of affliction, but also how we are to use that to comfort those around us, Specifically, the church, right? This letter was written to the church. So again, right, suffering is going to happen. Um, and, that's, and that's a reality. And it happens to all of us. Um, but, but another point that I want us to see here um, in verse 5 is that um, suffering is temporary and it can yield great results. So if you look in verse 5, let's, let's read that to refresh our mind. For as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so through Christ our comfort also overflows. I think the first times that I read this, and I don't think I ever realized this until I was preparing um, for this moment right now, um, I never realized that phrase, for as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us. Right? Christ. Christ. Jesus. For some of us in here, he is our Savior, right? He is the one that we worship, that we we do what we do because of him, right? We are on mission for him. He suffered the most for you and for me, the most. And it is because of that suffering that we are able to do anything that we're doing right now. And he suffered the most out of anybody, right? Talk about an unfair trial, right? Accused, beaten, the worst, tortured in the worst way possible, killed in the worst way possible, all for what? He did nothing wrong. He lived life perfectly, but he did it for you and for me. And it's because of his suffering, right, that we can, we, we get to do what we do, and we can, we can point others to Christ because of that, and we can experience freedom in Christ, and we can have a relationship with him, and we can be restored because there's, right, God is down, or God is up here, right, and we're down here, and sin separates us. But Christ met us in the middle because, through all that suffering. 
And it's because of that and through that we get to have a relationship with him. And, and just, like, just like verse 5 says, right? So as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so through Christ our comfort also overflows. We're able to be comforted in these times when affliction is upon us, when we feel um, like we're the only ones left, like we feel the whole world is against us, right? So in simpler terms, right, the more sufferings that we endure here on earth, right, you can think about it like this, right? The better comfort you will receive in heaven, right? Because this earth is far from God. If you are a believer, this earth is the closest you'll ever get to being far from God, if that makes sense, right? Right, this earth, you are, if you are a believer, this earth is the closest you'll get to being far from God. And if you're a non-believer, right, the opposite is true in that this earth is the closest you'll ever get to being with God. But, but for the Christian, right, and in, in, in suffering, right, this earth is so temporary. It's so temporary. And the moments that we are here on earth, right, and any suffering that might happen, right, that is, that is one day going to expire. There is a time stamp on that. And so how, how sweet is the relief of, of pain and suffering when it's taken away? Right? I'm, I'm constantly reminded when I read passages like this, um, and I love the book of Ecclesiastes for this as well, um, but I'm constantly reminded of being scared of the dark. I was petrified of the dark as a kid. I was, I was so terrified of it, right? And I remember my, my parents would put me to sleep and they would leave my door cracked open so the hall light was on and shining through and I was, I was comforted by that, right? But what happened four or five hours later when I woke up in the middle of the night and they had gone to bed, the light was off, it was pitch black outside, I was petrified. I was scared. I remember like as I was getting out of that stage of being scared of the dark, right, there were times where I would lay in my bed terrified, so terrified of the dark, but I was, I was holding on to the fact that the morning was coming, that there was going to be a day, there was going to be a time when the light shined through, right? And, and the Christian walk is something similar to that, right? That we have the promise that Christ will one day save us from that, but better yet, right? Better yet, and this is getting me back to the whole picture of this book, right? My older sister, who was able to be like, Matt, listen, I went through this same exact thing, right? I remember being scared of the dark. But once you overcome that, right, let me show you. Let me show you how to not be scared of the dark. Let me show you why it's, it's not scary, right? I never would have been able to have that moment with her if I didn't share that with her. If I didn't share it with her and go to her and be like, hey, I'm scared of the dark. You're older. You know, you've, you've experienced this. Like, help me through this. And I think this is where Paul is pointing the church and saying, listen, guys, come together as a body, right? Share in sufferings. Share these things. Allow people who have walked through similar stages of life to walk through, help you through this moment because you're not alone. You're not left to your, to your own devices. So to wrap up um, just, this, just this first portion here of the fact that suffering comes with being a Christian, I want to, I want to remind you, I want to remind myself that, that we too um, should be and should have strive to have the heart of Paul and remind ourselves of the blessings that God has given us, right? That we should strive to follow the will of God and to serve the church that is God's with an attitude of grace and peace that comes from God, all the while giving praise to God for the mercies and the comforts that God has given us. And we can remember that suffering is bound to happen. It's, it's going to happen. And that when it does happen, we can find comfort in knowing that God is a master orchestrator. He knows. He, he knows all. He is in control of all, right? And, and just like Paul felt a need to share his sufferings with the church, right, we should also have that same heart, right? Paul Paul is not afraid to share any of the things that happen to him with the church. I think that's, um, that's really telling because I think myself, right, I just moved to New York um, not even a year ago. Moved my family away from um, a, pretty, a pretty comfortable job and living situation close to friends to an area where we didn't know anybody. 
right? And it's, it's unique. I, I had to catch myself a few times as I was, as friends of mine from back in Indiana would reach out and ask me how things were going, right? I was so tempted to just be like, oh, everything's going awesome. It's great. It's wonderful. When in reality, right, I was going through some hard times. I was having a hard time getting connected, right? I was having a hard time building relationships, right? It put a strain, that move put a strain on my relationship with God and my relationship with my wife and my son, right? Because it's a stressful time, right? But I was, I had to catch myself from just pretending like everything was okay and humbling myself and being like, you know what? Hey, actually I'm struggling. And it was in those moments that I was, I was able to grow a ton through those moments. As friends of mine reached out and they were like, hey, you know what? Uh, I went through a similar experience, and here's what helped me get through this. So I think, it's, I think it's really helpful to keep those things in mind and to remind ourselves that suffering is, the part, is, is, a, is a part of being a Christian. And then secondly, <clears throat> suffering should always lead to encouragement. Suffering should always lead to encouragement. And we see this in the, in the rest of the chapter, verses 6 through 11. So we saw in the previous verses how suffering can be really encouraging to us as individuals, right? That we can have comfort in the fact that God has given us the suffering, right? That he is in control of it all, that one day it's going to end. But Paul focuses these next six verses on the fact that it should be an encouragement to the church. <clears throat> Later on in the book, in 2 Corinthians, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder who might be teaching later on through this, but you will be reminded of some, some of the crazy things that Paul has gone through, right? He, he is, he's not a stranger to sharing about some of those things, right? And I think it's safe to say that he is perhaps, aside from Jesus, one of the most persecuted men to have ever walked the face of the earth. Um, the guy was stoned and lived through it, right? And so... Um, he, he, has, he suffered some incredible affliction, um, but I think that's what makes this chapter um, even more special, because we read in verse 6, if we are afflicted, this is Paul speaking, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and your salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is experienced in your endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. So Paul's mindset here is extremely important because he, he takes the mindset of we. And uh, if, if we are going through this, it is for your benefit, right? There's, there's a part of the, there's a picture here of like, we're all in this together. You know, you and me, we're like, we're, this, is a, this is a team effort. And I think it's really, really telling, and we can learn a lot by looking back in the Bible at some examples of times when people in the Bible didn't have that, that thought. They didn't have that mindset of, we're in this together. And so I flipped back through, and I, I did I just some, some of the stories that popped into my mind was Elijah, right? Faithful, faithful prophet in the Old Testament. Faithful guy, right? You can learn a ton from him. But he reached a point in his life for a moment in 1 Kings 19 where he says this, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are looking to take my life. And then he goes on later to ask God to take his life because he felt alone. He felt like the mission that he was in was a solo mission. He didn't feel like he could go to anybody else and share in his sufferings. And he felt alone. Jonah, right? A few chapters later, a few books later. Jonah, verses 4, 1 through 3. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. And he prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled towards Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who, does, one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah, another faithful prophet who felt so alone 
and, and so desperate that he's asking for the Lord to take his life. Let's look at Job, right? After this, Job began to speak and cursed the day he was born. You guys know that you guys know the story of Job, right? The man had everything going for him, and then God took it all away. He allowed it to be all taken away, and he felt alone. And he starts cursing the day that he was born. And the last example I want to share is is Naomi, in Ruth, verses one, uh, chapter one, verses twenty and twenty one. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has pronounced judgment on me, on me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So all these people, right, that we often sometimes herald as faithful prophets, with maybe the exception of Jonah, right? As faithful men in the Bible that we look up to, that we read stories and we're like, wow, God did amazing work through them. That is incredible. But all of them hit a point in their life where they felt alone. And they felt afflicted and despair in times of suffering. And and, in some of these moments, right, these people made uh, poor decisions and some of them made good decisions. Some of them, you know, got out of this tailspin they were in And they were like, you know what? I need to reach out. And God sent somebody to them that they could express their their sufferings to and their afflictions to. And and he he pulled them from that, right? Others decided not to do that. Others, we don't know what happened, right? But my point is this, and I think what Paul's point is, is that the Christian walk isn't meant to be navigated alone. Whether you are navigating a road that is easy or comfortable, right? Right? or a road that is difficult and full of suffering. It's not meant to be walked alone. And, and Paul is, is begging the church here almost to share with suffering, share in your sufferings with the body. Because look what Christ has, did, has done for us, right? And w- when, there's, when there's that unity of, of people coming together and praying for you and walking through those times with you, right? It's, it's a unifying experience. I have no doubt whatsoever that there has been some uh, struggles with, within the church at Mon River. All right? I have no doubt because it's, it's a church and those things happen within people. Right? I, I know Joshua and Angela. Right? I've no, I know some of the things that they've walked through. Right? And I also know how the church, this church has come together to support them and love on them and, and, and minister to them and be an, a source of encouragement to them. And I think that they would tell you they would be a lot worse off if they were just Joshua and Angela living in Pittsburgh in the middle by themselves. And there was no support there. But what's really cool is, is as much as we, you and I right, are, are commanded here to, to share in suffering with one another, whether it's suffering or whether it's comfort, right, highs and lows, I think what's really interesting is there's only one person who's able to endure this suffering alone. Only one person, right? And we all know who that is, right? That's Jesus. And I, 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 think, it's, I think it's fitting to read Matthew 26. Then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, his closest friends. My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he asked Peter, So why couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Please stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time, Jesus went away and he prayed, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. Right? And this is moments before Jesus was crucified for your your sins and for my sins. Right? 
He's on, he's on the brink of the most affliction and suffering that any person has ever gone through. And he is very much alone. But he alone was the only person able to overcome that. Right? And fulfill the Father's will through that time. And not be pushed and dragged down by the world. Whereas you and I, we're not like that. We're not Jesus. We don't have that ability. We need each other. We need the church. We need to constantly be reminded of that, of what God did for us, and that our suffering here on earth is temporary, and that it serves a much greater purpose, right? And so if you take that suffering in those times you've walked through, and you keep that in mind, you keep in mind the fact that, you know what? Yeah, I might be suffering now, but how can I use that to encourage the church? How can I use that to encourage our brother or sister in Christ immediately or maybe further down the road? Because maybe somebody else is going to walk through the same exact thing that I'm going through. And I can help them. I can come alongside of them. Or maybe it's something as simple as I'm going to share some of the suffering with the church so they can pray with me through this. And they can pray with me. And they can walk alongside me through this. Because then how encouraging is it to see those prayers answered and to see that come full circle? And the whole church is knowing, right? And they're getting down on their knees and they're praying. God, would you just be with this person? Be with the situation that they're walking through. Lord, we don't know what your plan is, but we look forward to seeing that plan. But comfort them right now, right? Encourage them. And then a couple days, weeks, months, maybe it's years later, right? That prayer is answered. And there's rejoicing. There's comfort. There's fellowship. God, we've prayed for this for so long and you answered it. Praise be to you. <clears throat> and I just, I just love that, this, that sense of camaraderie and that we see um, just pouring out in verse 7. And our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you will share in the comfort. And then verses 8 through 11, I think this is... Um, where we see why it is so important that we aren't afraid, ashamed, or embarrassed to share our sufferings with the church. Right? And this is Paul. He, he's writing very real words about a situation he had just walked through. For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired life. Indeed, we personally had a death sentence within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will deliver us. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us again. While you join in helping us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. And that's such, that's like so, so beautiful to read. Right? Paul's like, guys, we were afflicted. We were suffering. We didn't know if we were going to make it out of this alive. Literally. But we knew that there were people like you, churches like you, praying for us. Right? And that was a comfort to us. And we knew that this work that we were, re that we were doing, right, we were laying our lives on the line for the sake of the gospel, and that's never a waste. Never a waste. Right? That although it might be painful in the moment, right, one day they have the promise that God will deliver them, whether it's from that immediate suffering or when he calls them home to be with him, right, worshiping with him, standing alongside of him forever, for all of eternity. Right, we, we could sit and we could break that down over and over again, but um, I'll leave that to you, right, to come back to this, to have, to have these verses um, to come back to in moments of suffering, to, to read real people who walked on earth, right, some of them serving the same mission that you might be serving today, right, that have walked through sufferings in times of trial. And where do they find their encouragement? They found their encouragement in verse 10. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us again. Right? And then they're sharing that with the church. And they're saying, guys, 
be encouraged by this, right? Your prayers were an encouragement to us. Keep in mind that the, any suffering that you go through one day, right, will be so worth it. <clears throat> so I think I, when I think in terms of how this applies to my life directly, um, I can't help but think of the, the passages in Scripture that talk about the church as being a body of Christ, um, a, a literal body, right? The analogy that the church is a body. And I know that there are, there are multiple um, different diseases out there um, that when, um, so I have a, I have a nephew um, who has a condition um, that uh, if he hurts his foot, by way of an example, right? He hurts his foot, stubs his toe, right? He doesn't feel the pain in his toe, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, that doesn't register with his body that he hurt himself, right? He has to like physically look and be like, oh, you know, I, I broke my toe. I should probably do something about that. I think the church is, is, is meant to operate as a body in the sense that if that is the case, right, a lot of damage can happen. If somebody in our church is going through suffering and they, they neglect to tell the rest of the church about that, right, a lot of damage can happen, right? If, if my nephew continues to, to live his life with a broken toe and never does anything to heal that, right, that's going to have some pretty severe consequences and repercussions down the road. But if he notices it and he has to physically tell his body, hey, um, we got to do something about that. I, we have to go make sure that, that we set this correctly and that I, I'm really careful on, on how I walk on this and how, how I deal with this. Right? And, and the, the body of, the, of Christ is, is similar. So if we're going through suffering and we decide to keep that to ourselves, right, we're hurting the church. Because the church is like, we, we need to operate as a body together. And if, if one of us is not operating at full function because we're suffering, we need to bring that in. So the church can be like, hey, let's focus on healing this person. Let's focus on encouraging this person and pointing this person to Christ and the comfort that we receive through Christ. <clears throat> so I think that's just some of the um, tones that Paul is trying to set for us here um, in 1 Corinthians. As before he even dives into any more of these serious, weighty uh, matters um, that, 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 he, he, that he discusses here in 2 Corinthians. And um, <clears throat> in way of, a way of a encouragement, um, I think we just have to remind ourselves um, of not only the, how Paul starts out this letter, but also how he closes this letter. In verse 11, or this passage, not the whole letter, but how it, how it closes out this passage. While you join me and help, while you join in helping us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. So it's keeping in mind that, of the bigger picture of what Christ has done, right? And then the strength that he gives you and me. And then it's cool. Uh, I'm going to bleed over a little bit um, into verse 12. As he hinges off of this, talking about suffering, talking about finding our comfort in Christ and sharing that with the church, he hinges off of that and says, for this is our confidence. The testimony of our conscience is that we have conducted ourselves in the world, especially towards you, with the God-given sincerity and purity, not by the fleshly wisdom, but by God's grace. I think that's really, really cool <laughs> that Paul is like, you know what? In these times of sufferings, we held true to what God says, and we have confidence in that. We have confidence that we, we stood strong in our, in our times of suffering. So stand strong in your times of suffering and utilize the church Right? Share that suffering within the church. Thanks for listening to this teaching today. If you'd like to take the next step in following Jesus with the church at Mon River, we invite you to go to atmonriver.com and click on the button that says connect with us. May God bless you with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, our Lord.